morning. Welcome, Butler Church of the Nazarene. It is good to see everyone this morning. Let's all stand together. And give thanks and praise and glory and honor to our good Father in heaven and his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. gathered in his name he is there oh for all who come who run to him in faith he is there there is power in the name of Jesus
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 That is who. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only.
I needed more volume on that. You know what I mean? It was like the band was here and the video was there. Ah, but praise God. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? It's good to see all of you. We're glad you chose us to worship with today. I see we are all in our fashion masks. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I always believe that whenever people show up, God has a reason that you're here, and he knits a particular group together, and uh, we pray that you just experience God in a fresh way today. So we're in the middle of a sermon series called Love Reigns, and we started on Easter. We kicked it off on Easter, and our, our goal Easter, what we saw was they were mocking Jesus, and they were calling him the king of the Jews, but his authority wasn't so much in avoiding the cross. It was basically defeating the cross and resurrecting from the dead. And then after that, the second week, we talked about being a new creation, that our past no longer defines us. And it was the love of Jesus that kept him on the cross for the joy of our salvation. Again, meaning he could peer right through time and see everything that was going to happen in the future because of what he did on the cross for the joy of our salvation. And today we continue the series by taking a look at what this means for us here and now. His love reigning in our present lives here and now. And because of God's mercy, we can live the lives that we were intended to, to live. Long before video games, long before Nintendo came out, there were some simple games. One was called Simon Says, you guys remember? <laughs> Are you that old? I don't know, I just, uh, uh, let me just refresh your memory a little bit. But um, I would say Simon Says, and then you do the thing that's instructed. And if I don't say Simon Says, then you don't do that thing. Let's give it a test run. Simon Says, clap your hands. <laughs> Simon Says, stop. Ooh, some of you stopped before. Simon says, put your hand on your head. Actually, that was a song. Simple Simon says. Simon says, put your hand on your heart. Simon says, stomp your feet. Stop. Ooh, I didn't say Simon says. Tina got it right. Okay. It was a test to see your willingness to follow the instruction or to get tricked into ignoring it altogether. You know, so, and of course, we're given a free will of our own. And that will is full of our own desires, our own convictions. And we live day to day with having to make a plethora of decisions. And, and we're constantly trying to weigh the outcome. Is this the best one to make? Is that the best one to make? And it could be extremely exhausting. And uh, some decisions will be influenced by things we're told to do. And we find ourselves listening to voices that sometimes don't always have our best interests in mind. But praise God, because of the love of God, we have another option, and we can listen for his voice, listen to the prompting, and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, my first bullet point, the choices I make, my choices reveal who reigns in my life. Um, the things we choose to do or choose not choose to do kind of show us who we're listening to. And that could be a painful litmus test after a while because you get to see where your allegiance lies or with what or with whom. You know, so it's... Our past is that whole collection of wise choices or unwise choices that we made. And when we look back on it, we can kind of see who was in charge when we were making those decisions. Now, for a lot of us, for me, look, I didn't come really into the Lord and walking with the Lord until 1990. So I could say all of my decisions prior to that were probably based on me being a fallen creation and acting out of my sinful nature. It's just the way it is. I think you guys can identify with that also. Um, more so listening to the voices of the world and the voices of the culture. Now, James said, temptation, God never tempts you. God didn't put that thing in front of you to give you a test. It wasn't God that did that. But he said, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and then drag us away. That word entice is a fishing term, bait. So bait is thrown in the water or lure. You see it nice and shiny. And it drags you right away, right? It, it entices us. It drags us away. Now, the Apostle Paul had a lot to say about living under the influence of God's love rather than listening to the voices of all the world. And Paul, you have to figure, when he wrote the book of Rome, Paul did not found a Roman church. It was already there. And there was an emperor that came to Rome for a while, and he kicked all the Jews out. So you had Jews that were following Christ, and then you had the Gentiles, which is anyone that's not a Jew, and then that emperor died and everybody came back together again. Now imagine all of them in the same place of worship. 
You had the Jews that were crossing every T and dotting every I, and they were following the law still. And then you had the Gentiles that were swinging off the chandeliers, and they're all about grace, and they're getting drunk on communion wine. You know, <laughs> they're bringing in big meals, and you got the haves and the have-nots. And Paul spoke about that in the Corinthian church. But in his book to the Romans, I'm going to read you two different translations. The ESV is the English Standard Version. When you're studying, you're going to school, that is the most readable version closest to the original text. And then the message translation is a paraphrase. But my commitment to the word of God is to take the word and make it plain. So I want to give you both of them. Let's start with the first one, Romans 12.1. Now, this is from the ESV. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. He, notice he calls them all brothers. By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Okay, now for the message paraphrase. And you might think they're far apart, but they're really not. It's a different nuance saying the same thing. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, which would be where he put the mercies of God, take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life. Place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing we could do for him. And Paul, by, he's beginning by saying, the instruction I'm about to give you, it needs to be seen through a specific lens. And to fully grasp this new way of living in the present, we have to see life in a certain way. When I was uh, 17 or 18, when we had a driver's license, we would... If you had a girlfriend, you'd go up to Scenic Drive in Atlantic Highlands. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. It was a big overlook, and they used to have a German restaurant up there. That's not there anymore. But um, if you finally got out of the car, <laughs> you would walk over to the edge of the overlook, and they had this big metal contraption. You know, you'd put a coin in it, and you'd peer through it. And it was amazing how the skyline looked through the edge there. You had the beautiful water. All of a sudden came up close, and the bridges and, and the skyline there. It was a whole different view. It changed everything because you changed your point of view. So Paul's goal in the whole message here, he goes, I want you to see your life in a certain way. And, and he does it by, I want you to reframe your present situation, but here's the lens. In view of God's mercy, that's the lens he wants you to look through. In view of God's mercy, and just understanding and getting this down can change your life. How many of us walk around grumbling and complaining because we don't like our present situation or don't like the cards we've been dealt, you know, and we try to control it all and we want everything, you know, we want to please ourselves, of course. But Paul invites you to start looking through the lens of mercy. And God's been so merciful to you and I, he sent his one and only son to die on a cross because of his mercy. He offered us a fresh start and repentance turning around, a new way to live because of his mercy. He loves us unconditionally, unconditionally. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any more or any less because of his mercy. And that alone, you start looking, it could help move your focus from, you know, this is what I want done for me to the things God has already done. And this is from what I want to what I've already been given and, and from being all about me to being other-centered. You know, it just, it takes your mind and puts your focus on something else. When we turn our attention to the mercy of God, we could be compelled to live our lives as Paul would call it, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, the sacrifice thing, <laughs> it's, it's rich in imagery to who he was talking to at the time because they were under the sacrificial system. That meant taking an animal, and, and whether it was a goat, a sheep, or a bird, and you would, that animal's blood would atone for the sins of the people. So the person bringing the sacrifice, that would cover the life of that person bringing the sacrifice. It involved death, it offered life. That's why Jesus was considered the ultimate sacrifice for all of humanity. So, so why is Paul saying this term living sacrifice? That's a, that's a little, you get a glimpse of the meaning, and that's a little harder than a dead one, but you get a glimpse of the meaning in Psalm 51. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Now, this is way Old Testament. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. My own Lefebvre, great musician, saved me. Elvis actually took one of his songs and asked him if he could use it. 
and then Mylan got royalties. He got about $90,000 in royalties off that one song, which is equivalent to $700,000 today. But Mylan's music just saved me because I couldn't handle the Nash stuff that was coming out of Nashville. I'm like, I'm a Christian. I got to listen to this stuff. And <laughs> I was coming out of the rock world. But he used this psalm, you know, Mylan Lefebvre, Broken Heart, that broken spirit and a contrite heart. The broken and a contrite heart means a humble heart. It means I'm humble. I see the real me. I am worn over that condition. And, and I come to God behind that. So it's not so much... The sacrifice wasn't there. It wasn't really about the sacrifice. God owns every animal. Do you think he needs an animal? He owns all the birds. He owns the whole world and everything in it. It was about the heart behind the sacrifice. And that's, was it a, a contrite heart? Was it an obedient heart? Or were they just going through the motions? That was the Cain and Abel thing, Adam and Eve's kids. Abel's sacrifice, God was very pleased. Cain's sacrifice, God was not pleased. I believe it was the motivation behind the sacrifice. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. You know, humble heart. You know, God doesn't want or need external religiosity without the inward heart change. He wants your heart. And people get a mindset when they worship. It's like, I'm going to bring worship. I'm going to do something. I'm doing God a favor. It's moralism, really. Uh, we think our ethical life and all our religious observance can put God in our debt. And now he owes us because I've been doing this. You know, it's so subtle. <laughs> it's so subtle. You have, need to examine your heart because does God really owe you a better life? He promised you more and better life than you ever dreamed of, and he's giving you eternal life. But does he owe you a better? He already sent his son to die for you, right? So, again, we think that if I live an ethical life and I observe all this religious <laughs> travesties, that, that um, God is completely in my debt. And if I obey those things... Am I doing it because I want something from God? Or am I doing it out of the wonder and the love of what he's done for me? That's the, that's the, if we can find that groove, man, that's a whole other thing. Paul calls us to be living sacrifices. Like I said, it's a lot. A dead one can stay on the altar. He doesn't go anywhere. We're living sacrifices. We could crawl off the altar at any time we want. They used to put hooks, right? And I don't want to get into it. It's kind of gross. But, but we can walk off that altar anytime. Paul says, no, in view of God's mercy and love, be a living sacrifice. Live now in the present under the rule and reign of God's love. That's how I want you to move forward. And, and Paul goes on. The second passage, he gives us the outcome of doing this. And again, I'm going to read both translations. First, the ESV up on the screen. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is the will of, what, what's the million dollar question? What is the will of God? What is good, acceptable, and perfect? Now let's look at the message paraphrase. Don't become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without even thinking. That should hit every one of us. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. You notice life always comes from the inside, whether it's a woman giving birth or it's uh, uh, an animal cracking from an egg that can bring life. It always comes from the inside. He wants to change the mainspring. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best develops well-formed maturity in you. Man, if this didn't speak to me, because I just, as you know, I had a, a gift. Someone said, I need a beach for a week, and I, I ended up in South Beach with a friend of mine, not knowing, we didn't know it was spring break. And uh, I got a real good glimpse of the culture around me because I'm kind of inwardly uh, insulated. But now you guys know I love kids, and I love, I, I get it. College kids, man, you've been locked up for a year, and you're blowing off steam, and, you know, but it, again, underneath that, on the, we were on the main strip, and on our deck part, which is we were sitting way back from there, you have a group of guys, and they got their bottle of Patron, their bottle of uh, Clico champagne, and some Cavassier, and all you smell was weed, the funny weed all over the place. And, and that was, the, none of the bottles were open, that was the bait, that was the lure. 
And then the girls got their thing going on too. They're walking by and they're doing the twerking thing. You know, can somebody give us an example of that? Don't, uh, don't do that. And, and you know, they're going crazy. So I was just looking and I'm going, wow, look at where the culture's at, mostly from whatever rap culture. I don't, I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm just saying. And they're all seeped into it, just like we were when we were that age too, you know. But it's good to, it's good to, not get caught into things. You need to identify the lies that you believe. You know what I mean? Um, Carl Jung, philosopher, said this. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you'll call it fate. You have to see things for what they are. You know, and pray to, pray to God that you will see things, that he'll open your eyes of your heart. The patterns of the world around us, if you completely fall into them, will lead you to a broken life. Uh, these patterns are marked by what? Uh, greed, patterns of greed, patterns of selfishness, pride, envy, gossip. The world is angry. The patterns of anger, you know, and, and all of it, all of it. It's just, and even taking the purity of what God designed, God gave us sex to have fun with it and, and in the proper context. But even taking that purity and then turning it into a complete distortion. So where now you're being objectified and you're not really experiencing true love. And when that happens to you, what happens? You start receiving emotional wounds, spiritual wounds, just like physical wounds too, you know? So uh, again, and we often fall into these patterns. They're so easy to fall into and they're, they're a little difficult to transform, you know? And they're called patterns because they become routines. And we, we often do them mindlessly. Most of the things you do in the morning when you wake up are patterns. You go into your groove. You're not even thinking about what you're doing, and you're just doing them, right? The second bullet point is changing your patterns will change your life. Another way to say it, change your habits, change your life. Um, if you pay a little attention and really lo look down on get introspective, you can easily identify the pattern. And we learned how to do that since we were kids. But you need to recognize our ruts. There's an illustration on the screen after a while, if you look at it, what do we got there? A triangle thing, square, triangle thing, square, colors. But you can see what happens next if you study it, right? If you look at it, you'll know what happens next. And it's once you know the pattern, what happens next should be pretty obvious. And the same can be true as our lives as well. You know, once if I pay attention to my patterns, I can anticipate what's going to happen and understand what's going to happen next. And then we can change them. We can work on changing them. And to identify the pattern, sometimes you got to get a different, whole different perspective. And maybe that's why Paul says us, you know, to see life in view of God's mercy. And then whenever we understand God's love and his mercy, if we really understand it, then we'll find good reason to transform our lives and renew our minds. You know, uh, you might have developed a pattern when you make a mistake, you start really talking down to yourself. What's wrong with you? You're stupid. You're never going to get it right. You know, and that's been fed into our heads when we were kids. These things hit us when we were kids. Paul says, break the pattern. Do not conform to it any longer. You might have found a pattern of um, telling lies to people around you. And that always leads to more lies. And that leads to a deceptive lifestyle. Paul says, do not conform to it any longer. Break the pattern. Uh, maybe you have a pattern of laziness in your life and... That produces a spirit of apathy towards your, your work and your family and, and, and your dreams, you know. And like I said, though, I think we all have a spirit of apathy somewhat after this pandemic. It's just we don't have the energy that we had before, you know. And we, have, we can get that back. Um, but remember the physical wounds take time to heal. If you break your arm or your leg, you got to put it in the cast. It takes six, eight weeks, nine weeks, whatever it takes. And God is working on you. When you bring it to the Lord, it's, it's in increments, little by little, little by little. Don't expect it all, boom, you know, and keep that in mind because it could trick you. And at some point, you know, you're, you're not getting that serotonin hit again and, and, and you start crashing, you know, and you might have a relapse. But brush it off, get up and keep going. Do not give up. Do not give up. God is working. It takes time. These lockdown orders... And they were necessary, I'm sure, you know, but they dragged on for so long during the coronavirus and long time habits gave way to, to bad ones. They did. And people who hadn't indulged in, say, bread, cookies and cake, they started baking up a storm. 
and we were all chomping, chomp, chomp. You know, I was anyway. Um, people, people who had strong work habits in the office, now they're working from home. And you know what? They were getting distracted, and, dis- and they, maybe the kids were home, and they weren't feeling as, un- as productive as they were. People that had good exercise habits, me, um, they fell when, when all the gyms closed and everybody isolated. It was hard to get myself motivated. I was very distracted, and it's hard to get moving again. And then you start turning into a couch potato. We need to, in view of God's mercy, don't let, don't continue the pattern. Break it and experience better life. Experience, hoping for a better life isn't going to bring a better life. You, you have to do something. Patterns that honor God will bring a better life. Bullet point three. Trade your will in for God's will. That's what Paul is getting to. Carrie Underwood said it best. Jesus, take the wheel. I said it to my friends. I sit in the passenger seat. Now God drives the car. You know, but the ultimate outcome of this sacrificial life and renewed mind, Paul tells you, will enable you to distinguish the will of God for your present life. How many in the room today, you know, you're still struggling with decisions that you make. Is, is this the best one? Is that the best one? What should I do here? What should I do there? And a lot of us want, we want to do what God wants us to do when it comes to your career, who I'm going to marry, who I'm dating. These are important things. You know, I want God's input on this. Trust me, you know, or where we invest my resources and my energy. And Paul says the best way to know the will of God is by trading our will in for his and creating healthier patterns in our lives, better patterns. I used to think your calling, everybody was trying to figure out their calling. I used to think your calling was something you had to run out and go and find, kind of like a Rubik's Cube or Chinese, those Chinese puzzle things, you know. But I found that your calling isn't something you have to go out and find. It's a natural outpouring of who you are. And right there you can go boom and drop the mic. I mean, that's a mouthful. That reality frees you to be who God created you to be. And and you don't need to figure it out. You just need to be available to God's leading and then use the gifts and abilities that he has hardwired into you. You are the will of God. And if you step out of the will of God, he will check you. What if we traded our time and energy that we used to spend on old patterns in our lives that weren't too cool or we just slipped into and we created new patterns with better outcomes? You know? And then now you're under the reign and the love of God's mercy and life. And you're, now you're spending time creating new patterns, spending time in prayer, spending time in meditating on scripture. There's daily breads back there. Take them. They're great. You know, and start somewhere. Just start one verse. Ask God, what do you want me to see in this verse? And, and just start serving others rather than being served myself. You know, a natural, a natural outpouring of good, doing good things whatever they are, but God promises to lead us and to show us his will for our lives when we come under the plan of God. The book of Proverbs speaks to this just as well. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That's what Paul was saying in, in your everyday life. Bring it to them. Um, lean not on your own understanding. I think the most dangerous person sometimes is the most difficult to talk with is someone who doesn't know that they don't know. You know? And you're getting into it. It's like, wait a minute. I don't lean on my own understanding. So many things are above my pay grade, you know, and no one has all the light. So it comes down to a, uh, but if we, if we don't lean on our own understanding, we ask the Holy Spirit for help. You have a personal mentor called the Holy Spirit. You have a private PM. And he promises to always be with you. If we ask him for help, he will start, he, you will begin to see the straight paths of God that he has laid out for you. It comes down to in God we trust. You know, it's really trusting that God loves me and always wants the best for me. And you got another guy in there, a spiritual enemy, that's going to be trying to throw the guilt and throw the shame on you because then you could lose your confidence And we talked about that last week. But the debt has been paid in full. All of your sins have been paid in full. How many parents we have here? Okay. That's a joy. I know when I'm around the kids, I I love it. I I just, you know, they give me energy and they're just so much fun to be around. But I know it's not all fun and games. You know, I'm sure there's certain years when they hit that's, whoa. 
<clears throat> they have very strong wills, you know, and, and that prefrontal cortex where they make their decisions and where, they, where you practice self-control, that's not fully developed till you're around 25. And then for an adult, if you were getting high a lot and you were doing some things that, you know, weren't healthy for your brain, this gray matter emits and then it starts shrinking that prefrontal cortex. The good news is with proper nutrition and putting healthy things in, that comes back. Um, the book I'm reading now is Your Brain is Always Listening by Dr. Daniel Aman. It's a great, great book. It's a great resource. But I'm sure when you get to your kids, if they step out of line somewhere, you have to discipline them, you know, or they'll just be entitled all their lives. So you have to do something. You might have to punish them, time out, whatever it is. And I bet it's really hard to convince them that you're doing this because you love them. <laughs> You know, you have to trust me. I have more life experience. I love you. That's why I have to do something here. It, trust is hard to, it's hard to learn and it's hard to teach. I think it's earned. You know, it's earned after a while. And that's why we can trust God's love is because, you know what, they'll, I mean, once they, once they have kids of their own and all, they'll, they'll see why you were doing the things you did. But we can trust God's love because look what he's done. Look what he's done for us. Look at the prophecies in the, in the Bible. If you look at the ones that were already fulfilled, it's the same thing as taking the state of Texas and putting silver dollars there with marking one red, putting them four feet deep, and you find that one. That's what the odds are that the prophecies that already came true, are, would, uh, that's what it signifies. Never mind the ones that are still yet to happen. So we can trust God. We can trust his love for us. Um, to be practical, when we mess up and we, in, in ways of changing these patterns. And, and basically over time, patterns are processes that are developed to whether the ones get us healthy or the ones not so much, you know? So the first one, first bullet point would be don't conceal it, reveal it. Don't conceal it, reveal it. Proverbs speaks to this, Proverbs 28. People who conceal their sins will not prosper. Boom. They won't find the freedom in Christ. They won't realize the love of God. They'll have guilt on them. They'll have shame on them because they're trying to hide stuff. And, and, uh, and not that they're any different, but they're just being held down by our spiritual enemy. They will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, meaning uh, like, Lord, help, I need help, I'm struggling. If they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. If you haven't turned and you're still struggling and still struggling with it, that means you haven't overcome it on your own, you know, and because we were designed to heal together. There's two types of confession. We talked about it the other night. We confess to God and we confess to people. And, and confessing to God for forgiveness, no matter how dark it is or no matter what it is in your life, the verse I gave you last week, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, all, all unrighteousness. What We receive mercy and we're cleansed from sin and that past shouldn't define us anymore. Only if you let it, right? But it's, it's gone, it's clear. Now, confessing to people, James says, confess your sins to one another and pray that you might be healed. So remember I said you have an injury. You're, you're, you have a spiritual injury, you have an emotional injury, you might have a physical injury, all of these things. You're not that strong on your own. You're only as sick as your secrets, and on the other flip, you're only as strong as you're being honest and you're bringing it out. You know, it's, and give time time. You know, like I said, it, it happens in increments, little increments along the way. So it takes about, I think, 90 days to begin to stabilize. You know, you have, like I said, you have that energy, but once formed, the good patterns take the same amount of energy as the bad ones did. We're still learning, we're still changing, we're still growing. Breathe, breathe. God will make a way when there's absolutely no way he will. And the reality of this whole thing is you're handpicked by God, you're chosen by the creator, you are a child of the king, you are known and you are loved. Own that, own that. We have to appropriate that. I wanna close with a verse in Isaiah. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Man, you guys are stronger than you thought you were. You know, I mean, come on, surprise, you're still here, and it made you better. 
You weren't ready for it, but it's here. And it's kind of surprise, and God does surprise us. The unexpected happens in our lives. I want to pray, and I want to invite you to pray with me in, in a specific way to, to really ask you to offer up to God those old patterns and help you create these new ones and invite you to start living just completely out of the love of God and see that by the mercy of God. Amen? I can have the musicians come forward, please. And for those, let's bow our hearts. Let's pray. Pray with me, please. Lord, we cannot give you anything without remembering that both the thing I'm giving you and even the desire to give it to you are both from you anyway. We can never put you in our debt. And because of what Jesus did, I am not my own. We were bought with a price. Give us insight to this and rid us of all the, the grumbling and, and self-pity. And may you give us wisdom to examine our hearts and examine the patterns of our lives. Help us, Father, to create healthy patterns that please you. And show us the gaps between our faith and our practice. And I beg you, please empower us to close them. We are better together. In Jesus' precious name, amen, we pray. Thank you, folks. That was a mouthful. Oh, thank you. Let's all stand together.
I'd like to share this card with you. Um, Dear Pastor Chuck, I got this in the mail last week. I was so happy to attend your Easter service. I totally got your message. I had a donation with me, but didn't know where to leave it. That white box back there, <laughs> Michelle's going to actually put something on it that says giving station. But um, I'm just pointing it out. That's, that's where you leave it. But it was really nice of her. She sent us a check, and I thought it was one. Then she came all the way from uh, the Lincroft area. I want to close with this. I can print this out and send it to anyone who wants it. Reaffirm your position in Christ. Remind yourself who you are and what you have in Christ. It helps to do it aloud. You could say something like this. I know that I am a child of God. I am saved. I have been placed into Christ. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. My eternal destiny is determined, and nothing can change that. The Lord will never leave me or forsake me. The angel of the Lord encamps around, uh, camps around, about me. Nothing can touch me from what my loving Heavenly Father allows. All things will work together for my good since I love God and have been called according to his purpose in Christ. Those are great truths. If you want to copy this, I'll, I'll put it in an email and I'll send it to you guys. But I, I, this is a great thing to read every day. So thank you for coming. Um, love you. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and turn his face towards you and grant you peace and put his blessings upon you and your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Aww.